very much for stopping by the Digital Creator Daily. Uh, if you are new here, I'm Rob from Hey Summit, and this is the Daily-ish show where I get to have some awesome conversations with brilliant people doing interesting things. Uh, we talk about the creator mindset, staying authentic, assembling your toolkit, exploring platforms, and more. Um, it's a pretty relaxed show about and for creators, thought leaders, and independent entrepreneurs. Uh, and just a reminder, regardless of how you're you're watching or listening to this, whether it's live or, or on the podcast later on, uh, a conversation is best when it's shared. So however you are tuning in, feel free to jump in with your thoughts, questions, perspectives, and uh, just thanks for spending a bit of time with us. So uh, I'm really, really happy to welcome uh, Neil Ludewig to the show. Um, the, uh, Neil is a producer, curator, environmentalist, artist, uh, and entrepreneur focused on challenging dominant systems in today's world. Uh, currently the CEO and founder of Moon 31. His work has been covered internationally by the New York Times, Rolling Stone, CBS, among others. Uh, he's helped launch Enlightened Snacks, a national CPG company that redefined the health food industry and uh, uh, the ice cream aisle, which I am quite uh, envious of or, or would like to learn a little bit more about. Um, I don't need any any ice cream though. Uh, outside of Moon 31, he currently serves as the executive producer for the Revive Big Band's next album, led by Lauren Hill's uh, current musical director. He's a co-founder of Snarky Elephant Productions, a producer and writer for the miniseries Insomnia, and hosts FED Sessions, Fed Sessions, uh, a dinner series where uh, thought leaders and invite invitees, quote, make bread, uh, make and break bread together. Um, he was named an emerging, emerging leader by the Association of Performing Arts Presenters. Uh, Neil uh, received a congressional proclamation for his work with the Harlem Arts Festival. There are just so many things about you that we can go into right here. Uh, but welcome, Neil. Thank you so much for, for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. So I think anybody who's listening to all of that can, <laughs> will, will, prob <laughs> will, probably, will probably get the sense that you do a lot of stuff and you're involved in a lot of stuff. Um, and I know you. I know you. Kind of your your root was obviously uh, is this balance between you know art and art, art, artistic endeavors and and business. And you went to business schools. But can I can I um, can I hear from you? Like, how did that journey work? And how did you get from where you were to here? <laughs> how much time? Uh, do you have? I wish I could <laughs> say there was a plan uh, that I thought of ahead of right. time, but there absolutely wasn't. I think the biggest thing that led me here was uh, kind of trusting my gut a little bit uh, and going with the flow and I think, you know, seeing what felt right. You know, the, the short condensed versions, I went to school, I didn't know what I wanted to do afterwards and had recommendations, go to another country. So I literally moved to South Korea, did a backpacking stint around West, Western Europe and came back here and got an internship at a position that uh, an, an internship at a booking agency that uh, sort of helped define like the next 10 years based off of who I met through that and uh, where, what community I was living in. And even from that, you know, I, I had some friends, we put together uh, a festival just by brainstorming, there's an empty space here, which I didn't know I couldn't have told you about or knew anything about, or especially about the Harlem community and that kind of history two years prior. So it was completely, I, you know, I think it was being in the right place at the right time and making opportunities from, you know, a, a lucky circumstance. And yeah, I mean, I think it, that, so a little bit of that and absolutely just the people that I stayed in connection with. I mean, you mentioned the ice cream thing. I mean, that was, that was because I stayed in touch with a friend uh, from college who happened to <laughs> decide he wanted to launch an, a healthy ice cream company. And we just stayed in touch and said, hey, I think you'd be a great person to do to build something with. And that's I, pretty so, much it. I mean, so make taking advantage of the opportunities that you're that, that are in front of you, but also maybe not going with the flow, but as you were saying, kind of going with your gut in terms of what it is that you're, you're, you're thinking is, is, is absolutely great. But there are multiple different routes that you could have taken, right? Like, and I, and I think that that it's always interesting to me to 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 learn about you know the road that you ended up choosing and, and maybe why you gravitated towards that route rather than others. So like for example, you interned at a booking agency. You could have started working in um, entertainment, you know, uh, entertainment business, right? You could have you could have been looking at working for like a large corporate and working your way through up up through that. Um, uh, seemingly awful, awful experience <laughs> from what I've heard. But, you know, like people are really, really, you know, jazzed about it, right? Like, um, um, 
but but it seemed like you you were gravitated towards like these smaller scale things that you could maybe do. Um, is there something about you uh, in terms of the way that you think that you think that like you're you're more geared towards um, the uh, the entrepreneurial side of things rather than the let's work it within a, an existing system and yeah. um, and grow through the ranks. Uh, well, I will say that I had an experience post college working. I mean, I was just trying to pay the bills and I was I was bouncing like you know three jobs. I was working at Jazz Lincoln Center in front of house. I was working at um, a creative licensing organization and um, and I was working at a place called theladders.com. I don't even know if they still exist, but there it was like a hundred, I was doing data entry. Yeah. That, but the experience of working in larger companies, um, you know, even, you know, for the ladders, I remember I was, cause I was bouncing between days and they didn't even remember who I was. I mean, we'd sit next to each other and that was the time when like Yahoo Messenger was a big thing. And, you know, I, at the time I think I was, you know, I was, I would turn to the person next to me and I'd say, Hey, cool. Like, what are you doing? They're like, no, no, no. All communication has to be through Yahoo. And I was like, what? Like you're sitting right next to me. Um, and then I remember I was saying, Hey, I, you know, I, I wasn't in one day and somebody, and I, yeah, I was messaging some people on, on the platform and saying like, Hey, I, I, you know, I wasn't able to come in. I was sick and I've got some plans coming up. Uh, you know, I've, I'm going to be taking this this uh, scholarship, presidential scholarship thing in Korea, so you know, I'm going to have to leave starting this time. And they didn't even realize I wasn't in the office. Um, it was just like they were so hooked in and 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 into their screen that, and you know, I, there were a lot of you know, there were a lot of people there. There were a quickly growing startup that was like right after the you know when businesses, uh, a, a lot of people lost uh, money and people were looking for jobs and stuff because of the. You know the recession and things, but yeah, I think the idea of working in a bigger company and actually both my parents uh, growing up, they worked at my mom worked at NBC, my dad, uh, and then later both of them worked at AT and T. The idea of like being in the cubicle, like the Dilbert situation, which ironically I love that cartoon. Uh, it I think it just didn't really gravitate towards me. I like the idea on um, connection. It's you know when I think about introvert extrovert. Um, you know, the, some people say like, how well you do in social situations. I tend to think it's much more of your recharge and I recharge well with people. I just know that about myself. So the idea of being in a large space um, sort of gives me, you know, the idea that there's, it, there's a heavy amount of disconnect, um, disconnect there. And it's, it can somehow feel like an isolating thing. So it, being, being in a, you know, to, to, to answer your question, the smaller entrepreneurial circumstances give, I think it's, it's an, it's a way to answer the things and work on the projects that I want to do and really closely with the people that I want to do it with. I, so I think it's really interesting that you say that because a lot of people would, could make the, like a similar argument for the opposite reasons. You know, you say it's actually quite isolating being in a large kind of organization and you're able to create what you want and recharge with the people that you want to recharge with. Whereas a, a lot of people would say, like starting a business is a very lonely thing. And actually it's it's very suitable to uh if you are, you know, working for yourself, you don't want to have to deal with other people. You can you can just be on your own. Um uh great for introverts, you know, like things like that. So I wonder why um or or it also seems like pretty clear that a lot of things that you do are they have they have community at the core of them. Um, but they they don't seem to you, you don't seem to do anything uh, unless it's if unless it's connected to uh, facilitating community connections. So I'd love to kind of understand why why that is. But also, like, do you find it? You know, typically an entrepreneur will say, "Oh yeah, it's a really really lonely experience." Do you find it lonely? You know, I I think the I think that's more of. I can only speak from my my experience, but I think the myth of you know the Steve Jobs, the Zuckerbergs, the you know these the Bezos, this kind of one person championing through lonely nights and things. That's I don't think I you know every company that I've started or been involved with has been with other people, and I maybe that's because that's just a very core value of mine, or that's sort of um, you know. Yeah, I, I think that's, I can't imagine, 
I think it, it, it would be a very lonely thing if the idea is doing it alone all the time, but I don't think anything gets done alone. I think that that true statement, you know, the truism, it takes a village is a hundred percent true. I kind of always, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think about this uh, episode of Fresh Prince that, uh, you know, there's, uh, he, he, he's like going to prom and uh, Carl, uh, Uncle Phil gives him a bunch of money and says, here, like here to pay, pay your way through this. And somebody says, well, I guess you're a banks now. And, and he's like, what? And he's like, yeah, you just took the money. You didn't do anything yourself. And so he rips it up and he gets a night job. And then when Uncle Phil sees that he's failing class, says, why, you know, why are you failing class? He says, well, I got another job. And he's like, well, clearly you're lying. When they finally confront one another, you know, he's saying, why did you get, take the job when I gave you this money? And he said, well, because I wanted to be like you. I wanted to be the self-made person. I want to do it all by myself. And he basically turns and says, you're a fool if you think anyone does things by themselves. People that give you those kinds of things and those opportunities do it because they love you. And returning that favor is using and maximizing the gift that they've just given you. And I'd like to integrate that idea that the people around me are the, the, you know, the people that I'm doing this for and with, and, you know, uh, sure, there are times that you're, you know, you just have to hunker down and do some work. But, you know, I'm, I'm do, trying to do the best job I can to surround myself with mentors and friends and people that can act in a lot of different capacities I can always lean on. And so maybe that's more of what you're alluding to, that there are times when you are working on stuff, you are seeking opportunities and funding, and only you are the person that can do it. But I think... Um, most of those times you've got people that you can lean to and talk talk to and and always ask for guidance and advice and you know i think this is kind of a filter that will sometimes help you see if your intention is true if you're in it for the money and you just want to keep all the money for yourself and that's why you're not bringing anyone else in then yeah it'll be lonely and you know probably not a very fun experience but i you know, it, it's much better to have, think of the, the mindset, you know, it's better to have a little bit of a lot than a lot of nothing. I think that's a, that's a, that's a really, really great point. And, and you, you also, you touched on a bunch of different things, like, you know, starting it with other people, but also realizing that you are, you are the product of the, 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 the people that you rely on in, in, you know, um, in general, how do you, or how did you maybe now it's, it's might not be as big an issue, but like, how did you go about finding those mentors, finding that 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 initial community? Was it always, you know, now you see 20 things that you're doing at the moment, it seems like, well, okay, you have your network, you have your, you're talking with people, you probably will meet meet someone and then think of something cool that you can do with, do with them. But when you were just starting out, how did you, how did you um, break into that idea of, hey, I, I have these people that I can go to for advice or or I have this idea, let, let me workshop it with someone else. How did you build that that you community first? Well, there's actually two things that you're making me think of. Uh, the first is I can definitely identify with that notion of how did how did you develop these research, you know, this this yeah. network and connect with these people. There was a point of, you know, probably five years ago, I was like, oh man, I wish I just had that badass mentor that's just giving you opportunities and saying, oh, cool, like I'm gonna connect you with this multi-millionaire or, or super famous person or whatever it is. And it just really started making me reflect and think, you know, because that was uh, actually around the time that I kind of reset from Harlem Arts Festival and was working on Moon 31. And and I, I had to think back uh, when I started Harlem Arts Festival and wasn't really thinking so hard about establishing these kinds of mentors. I remember we put together this project. It was me and two co-founders, um, JJ Alfar and Chelsea Goding. And we initially said, we're going to build this festival and we're going to program it because my background's in music, uh, Chelsea's was in dance and JJ's was in theater. And we went to an organization for support and said, hey, we're going to do this thing. We need this thing from you. And they basically said, who, who, who are you guys? Why, why on earth do you have the right to program this? Yeah. And, you're, and like, you're, we don't know who you are and you're asking us for stuff already. So why don't you go back? You can reframe this whole thing, <laughs> figure it out so that it's not so self-centered and uh, and you can try for another round. But in the meantime, why don't you come to some of our meetings? This was the uh, local parks organizations, the MMPCIA. Um, 
and, uh, and you know, and why don't you come to some of our meetings and see what we're about and get more involved? And I think that was one of the things, you know, truth be told, that I really loved about Harlem. Um, you know, sometimes it can seem it, it felt a little bit rough on the rough around the edges, but there was this, you know, that old guard that is very tightly guarding its legacy um, and its history and its culture. They, you know, there's a lot of those folks that are very, um, I think they look at some newcomers and, you know, or a lot of newcomers and say like, how can we, how can we teach you? And how can we take you under our wing? And especially for us, which we had, I think the, uh, the lucky aspect of just being younger people. And they say, Hey, like, okay, cool. We'll, we'll give them a little bit of tough love here. But what it seriously taught is the idea of getting a mentor and getting an advisor. The biggest part is not asking what can you do for me, but what can I do for you? And it's a fundamentally different approach that quite honestly has garnered some of the best things that I'm dealing with, the opportunities that I have now. I, even, even I'm literally gonna be on a film shoot in, in August, which the entire opportunity came from me saying, hey, how can I help you? Um, and I think when I reflected, when I was starting at Moon 31 and after doing some, some traveling that, you know, and thinking, okay, what's my next thing that I wanna do? reversing that question and that ask to everyone around me um, is what, you know, is, is really how I developed my network. It's how I um, learned the most things. It's how I got a base of supporters and probably quite honestly, some of my closest friends who did that to me, uh, who now I give more to them than they probably give to me. Or maybe like the point is who's counting. Um, I, I wrote, wrote about this a little bit there's a great book that I always refer to called Give and Take that talks about the idea of being a giver and taker. I'm literally going to say, let's talk Adam, Adam Grant for a bit. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Nice. Yeah. Uh, but so, so that's so that's kind of the, the crux of it. I think those, the you know, Harlem Arts Festival, and we're doing the same thing at Snarky Elephant now. We put together a board of advisors, uh, both artistically and sort of you know, community leaders and business leaders in, in the sectors for Harlem Arts Festival and for Snarky Elephant, we want to, we're doing the same thing. People that can really ensure that we're staying on track, staying true to our mission, that we're authentic to what we, what we want to do. And, you know, it's, I think it's really important. And this is, this is also a little bit of a salesman thing is to always frame every ask that you're doing of what you are doing for the other person. And I, you know, the best, the best piece of advice I can say is be authentic in that. If you come in with the mentality of I'm doing this just so that you can support me, those people are going to read through you. They get asked that stuff, you know, all the time. And, uh, you know, another thing that I wrote about and uh, who I think d did some, uh, I'm not sure if he still does it, but John Levy, he runs this thing called the Influencers Dinner that I talk quite a bit about that he gets some incredible people, like everyone from Questlove to you know, uh, the vice president to people, CEOs from Gucci and this and that, like to come to these dinners and talk actually everything that's not about their work. And when he was asked, how did people, how does he get these people to come? He, he, he leans on that exact thing. He says, well, I just, I just put the offer out and I don't, I'm not asking for them. I'm, I'm telling, Hey, you get a free dinner with some great people. And, you know, I'm being very genuine and I'm kind of giving unconditionally. And I think if you do that, you know, people are always attracted to people giving out free stuff. I always equate it to giving, giving free pie out, right? If I'm giving out free pie, some people are just going to run over and say like, oh, sweet, free pie and start stuffing their faces. There's always going to be folks saying, wait, what's the deal here? Why are you doing this? Is there a way, wait, maybe I can help you make the pie or I've got some other cookies. Let's make a dessert platter. But those people that are in those fantastic positions and those mentors, as you're talking about, are the people that have mastered the art of discerning who are the people in it for the free pie and who are the people that want to bake with you. It's a little bit also why, you know, I, I do fed sessions, that idea of making and breaking bread together. Um, I love that idea because yeah, those are the people that I believe that you have long lasting relationships with. So, I mean, like it, 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 it's, it's key that, you know, you're, you're at least the way that you've come up through all the different, things that you're doing and the way that you're speaking, there's a certain amount of resilience than one that one needs to have in order to not only feel capable of, of, uh, of going out and doing that, but also just being able to weather challenges, uh, and, and things that maybe not, uh, you know, don't go right. And I guess, um, 
I guess my question is about rooted in the idea of people and community. You're 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 an entrepreneur. You're also in the kind of wider arts community. Two areas that are requiring a hell of a lot of 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 resilience, um, and and then add to that the idea of just you having this this need to build things with other people. You know, it sounds super exhausting, right? But but um, but do you find like how do you how, resilience? They say is like a you know it's like a muscle, right? How do you practice that muscle? Um, to make sure that you are taking care of yourself and being able to see progress being made when maybe you're just in the muck at, at, at you know, at some point, like, is there, is there, are there certain things that you do or, um, or is there a certain way that you look at that? Yeah. I'd even say those things have changed over time, but there was definitely, um, I actually worked with a, a coach who was, who was and is a mentor uh, of mine that uh, we took some time to say like what are what are your values based on and what are your recharges in addition to being around people mine is being out in nature and traveling and you know I, there was actually a point in time when I was really kind of um, but you know putting the pedal to the metal uh, and and kind of going full steam I was doing Harlem Arts Festival uh, pretty much full time and I was uh, enlightened. Um, you know, and I was working at Enlightened like nine to nine, uh, plus weekends, usually waking up at four. And then I was doing Harlem Arts Festival when I would get home until like two or three in the morning. And it was just like rinse, recycle, repeat. And that was a, a stint of time that I actually, I think for like the two or three years, I almost didn't travel at all because I was just yeah. working so much. And I, I completely got depressed and I was so bummed out. I like physically got less healthy. Um, and yeah, it was, I think every time I reflect on that, I think like, wow, like there was like dark periods. Now there was some areas within that, that felt rejuvenating, right? Being around art, being around music and things. But I, you know, one of the reasons that I shifted uh, from, from Enlightened and Pacey did uh, Harlem Arts Festival full time was because I love eating ice cream. Uh, I think it's, it's great. And I think, I love the mission and I think what, you know, my partner at the time and he's a good friend, uh, Mike Shoretz is doing is super important, having access um, and making, making um, you know, re kind of redefine the ice cream aisle in the way that he or we did. It's super important to have healthy food. I mean, I mean I'm, I've been to enough places to know that sometimes they just don't even, you know, they're complete food deserts. Mm -hmm. um, but that was sort of my adopted baby. Uh, in a sense, as a startup, and we were putting the time and everything, but you know, I I literally told him when I was when I said, hey, you know, if you've seen Goodwill Hunting, I said, I kind of I got to go see about a girl, or like I got to go finish this thing with my baby, um, and see where it's going because it was just building up track record, and I knew that I couldn't do justice to what to what the amount of work that that position required because now they're one of the biggest food companies in the country, uh, so. Yeah, that work-life balance is really big. And I think before there was a lot of external activities that I was doing. I was going to concerts. I was going to events. I was trying to, you know, after that stint was done, every single year I made a promise to myself I would travel at least once nationally and at least once internationally. And now there's a few other things which um, have come have come on my doorstep from various places. Um, I try to meditate, so I've done transcendental meditation. Um, I did actually Vipassana a year and a half ago which uh, really grounded me in, in just taking some time and sitting and having a morning routine uh, and Vipassanas for, if you're not familiar with it, it's those like 10 day silent retreats. There's no phones, there's no connection, there's no reading or writing or books. You're, you're totally alone, but um, in, you're actually surrounded. It, it's this exact thing. You're alone, you can't speak or look or acknowledge anyone, but you're surrounded by people. But it's, it's about kind of addressing some of the things and, um, I think my biggest takeaway from that are actually two things is one, you have to make space for yourself to do those things. And every great founder does it. Um, you know, every major CEO in the world probably blocks at least an hour a day, just, just to think and just clear their mind and see what comes. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think, I think that's kind of the, at least, the, you know, that that's, that's definitely a, a very, very big, big thing. Um, I think that's, I think that's super important. Um, not just from the way that you're 
clearly it it is a it is a thing that you've you've learned but i think it's also maybe cracking a little bit on on that um on that shell of of everything being perfect oh you know i'm doing this stuff and that stuff and uh and i have time you know um i, I only need to sleep for four hours a day and every other time i'm every other moment i'm working and i fool the body I, exactly exactly but 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 i think there's this there's certainly this this sense especially when you're just starting out you know and i say this a lot so anybody who's listening to this probably like rolling their eyes right now but like when you are just starting out it is it is you 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 are the thing that people are are buying or selling or whatever mm -hmm. um and you're and you and because of that that there's a lot of pressure that you feel on yourself not just to be uh not just be successful whatever that means but also to not um make people not like you because if i'm selling you some ice cream and you don't like the ice cream oh well you just don't like ice cream but if if, if i'm selling me and you don't like me how am i right. ever going to recover right <laughs> and, yeah. and 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 so like there's there's a lot of pressure that we put on ourselves anyway in, in terms yeah. of how to 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 um to grow into that that role um and we kind of latch on to other people who are maybe talking up all the easy and all the fun parts of it and not really kind of understanding the 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 work that needs to be put in not just on your business but mm -hmm. but on yourself we're also totally a part of a, a generation and i would say the millennial generations but i would say what is it the x generation and um you know even more so this idea of constantly appearing like we should be working and constantly being on and, um, and i think part of that is you know this definition of success that was put in the nine you know in the 90s and moving forward that that it's you know working around the clock and the self-made entrepreneur and like especially when like the multi-billionaires and stuff started coming into play um but yeah i think that's that's a false like that, that's a false impression the idea of constantly being on it's not healthy and that's that's you know it's it's not realistic it's there's always a team whether you're not or you see it whether you see it or not there is uh, it's also you know talking about the definition of success and one that's often been portrayed as like it needs to be the multi-billionaire or the one who's got like you know bazillions of followers and stuff i it's making me think of a Chappelle thing where he's actually uh he was i think he was talking to his dad um about about comedy and the, he was bait and like being an actor and stuff and um and at the time you know maybe even about Chappelle show but he was saying that his dad was saying you know you should know that this is a the road to success is a hard one in this and most people don't get it and Chappelle responds by saying well that's a yeah but that depends on what your definition of success is if i can do this and what i love and i can make 40 grand a year and make a living and support my family then i'm successful you know then i'm doing exactly what i want to do and i you know yeah then i want to that's that's my definition of success and his dad says well Maybe you're smarter than you look, <laughs> you know, or like if that's if that's like what you're thinking, and that, then you might actually do well in this after all, um, because I think having uh, expectations that are just far a far cry away from what a is needed and normal in life. I mean, I, I will say, having lived in you know New York for ten years, what people think is the necessary lifestyle to live and what people put their money on. Um, you know, it's one thing to, I, yeah, I, I think that can be reframed a lot. And I think there's a lot of consumerism and media that, that contributes to that, but I try to spend money on my health and experiences, the things that, you know, will make this feel better and not, you know, a Gucci Look shirt better. or whatever, you know, I, 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 I think that's exactly right. I, I also, I, I certainly see in a lot of people that they have this crave to be successful and, and um, but at the end of the day, they don't really understand what that means to themselves. And so they just think it's money. They think it's, they, they think it's whatever latest thing they heard. Okay. This is, it's the six figure club. I want to join the six figure mm -hmm. club or whatever it is. And, and, um, um, and I, I think that in some ways that the unquantifiable nature of whatever it is that they, that they are saying is it's, it's this weird boogeyman where you, you, you know, you want it, but you actually don't know what it is. That means you want it even more. That means you 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 think of it as this mystical beast that you'll get somehow. Um, yeah. But someone will tell you, but then nobody will tell you. And so once you get that thing, you'll be like, it wasn't that thing in the first place. It was something else. And so so I, I just kind of going back to something that you said earlier, like you you were working with your coach and thinking about like what are your what are your values and uh, do you have a clear sense of what success looks like for you at the moment? Like or 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 are you constantly changing as well? Um, 
I think it's definitely shifted. Uh, something that kind of came, I can definitely say it's not an amount of money. Um, sure. And uh, I think, I think there was when I was, you know, making making me think about this when I left Enlighten, I was sort of put to that choice. Yeah. Of you know, I I was a partner in the company. I did have some some ownership, and the choice was it's like knowing where the company was valued and where it was going was do I want to leave this company? And at that point, I was forced to sell my stake. Um, you know, and you know, I could easily look at a track and say, cool, like if I work here for three or four years, like my equity plus salary easily will be over a million dollars. Does that do anything for me? Does it increase my happiness? How do I feel now? Does does this look remotely attractive? Mm-hmm. Um, and it was very clear to see that that was not the case. Mm-hmm. Um, I think at this point, my success, you know, I, I think a lot of it comes from you know, trying different things and seeing which of these experiences have made me feel the best. And so far, the stuff that's been the most rewarding and, you know, leaning back on what give and take is about is the stuff that has impact and being able to see the, see people like positively get benefited from the stuff that I'm doing. And I think there's, you know, there's a selfish side that we all kind of have. And I can tell you right now, I'm really interested in exercising my creative voice Hmm. and, you know, it's not the amount of money that makes a difference. It's I'm interested in being put in a place and having an opportunity to uh, take my voice and create something and give people an opportunity to, to look through my lens and see what I see. And hopefully in the process, um, come out having learned something they can take some kind of action on. Usually, you know, there's, uh, there's a little trick in there where I'm saying, okay, I want you to see what I'm seeing in terms of sustainability, like see what I'm seeing in terms of social justice, like look at these causes or LGBT advocacy, like there's a few different things I really care about. And see, like if I can make it, and we're, you know, we're talking about artists and but that's, I'm working on a film right now that's specifically about a lot of the struggles and, um, you know, the challenges that artists are facing in terms of stability and a lack of support and, you know, being in that lonely world and especially being in a very toxic environment. And I've been on that road, literally on the road as a tour manager with these artists and seeing what they're coming up, you know, coming up against. And surprisingly, there's no story about that. Um, and giving people the, I mean, there's the very glorified one that we see in the media, right? Get them to the Greek, um, you know, almost famous, those kinds of things, but nothing that really, I think, hopefully leaves someone walking away and think like, well, we need to change this. You know, this is, I I will say a little bit of a kudos, you know, pandemic aside, like this is the first time a lot of artists, uh, you know, we're, we're getting support as in just, just as gig workers. Sure. Uh, from the government, recognizing that these are essentially every artist is an entrepreneur and every artist is their own business and they have to be their own best salesman and they deserve support just like every other business owner. Um, you know, so, so yeah, I would say, um, I, I would, I would say those are some pretty important factors to kind of consider. I think that the, so Clearly, though, that I think a lot of the stuff, at least for you, is tied to your passion and 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 your interest for the for the subject matter, which is clearly mm-hmm. starting things that are impactful, whether it's towards an issue or towards a a, a specific group of of people and empowering them. Um, I guess I I and it's clear that like that is you that 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 that's you being your your authentic self. More of a practical question, that, I guess, is. Um, there are kind of two ways of, 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 of doing what you love. There's doing it as a hobby <laughs> and there's doing it that, 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 and the reason why you love it so much is because it, it, it really empowers you. Um, but for some people, the moment that that becomes their career, they, they are miserable. You know, <laughs> that, that person who's like, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of a person like, uh, maybe they're working uh, at a company and they think, oh, I might want to s- stop working and become a coach or co- become a consultant because I keep talking to these people about this and it really j- jazzes me up. And the moment they do it, then it's like, oh, okay, how do I pay the bills with this? I'm not earning a salary. And, you know, for, 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 for some people, they really do like that separation. Mm-hmm. Whereas for others, they, they don't, they seem to just be, get high on it all the time, you know, like that, that's really it. And so I guess for you, and especially with you in terms of in terms of what you do, you're also you're also building things communally. So it probably is never how you thought it was going to be. 
um, you know, at the end of the day. And I guess A is like, is that not, is that not exhausting as well? But also how do you separate the work and the life mode? Or maybe they're the same thing, but like, how do you approach that? Um, I, I'll say that in the beginning, there was less of a separation. And it was when I was talking about doing all those different things. Uh, I think I emerged from times at Harlem Arts Festival and times, you know, at times working at that booking agency. And yeah, I, a lot of my connections were professional connections because you, you sort of never turn the clock off. You're working, you're booking, you're managing, you're reaching out to different people. And then you go out at night and the, the concerts that you go, those are all coworkers and colleagues. I'll say that I definitely left that experience um, and those experiences reflecting on who are my real friends in the circumstance because I didn't really have that divide. And my I've been taking a much closer look at what friendship is and who are the people that I'm surrounding myself with and how I'm spending my time probably in the last like four to five years. And for, you know, I, I think I would say uh, the other book that I constantly refer to is Think and Grow Rich. And they talk about this idea of a mastermind alliance and making sure that the people that you surround yourself with are A, balancing your sets of skills, but that you are giving to them more than they give to you and seeing how they show up. Um, and I think combined with that give and take book, um, it's a nice balance because give and take talks about if you're a giver, what, it, what it's like as a giver when you meet a taker and how to know when not to succumb to the doormat effect, as he calls yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there there can be an exhausting thing, but I've been doing a much better job of knowing when to switch off and, you know, relying on some friends and thinking, you know, and kind of defining what are what are the important things for a relationship for me? I mean, there's a, a, a book which many people talk about, like, I forget, it's called The Five Love Languages or mm -hmm. maybe, yep. that, but, languages, yep. you know, yeah. understand, like, what is my love language? Like, yeah. how do I like the people that are important to me and that I care, you know, are they a giving me the kinds of, um, you know, support and care that I, I know that I need. Um, and when I express that to them, do they feel like they're receiving it? And you know, is there some kind of actual relationship, reciprocal relationship um, there? I think that's a, a really important thing to consider in again, when coming down to the recharge and having that separation, mm. I, I've been uh, somebody also clued me into a really cool notion about defining relationships that has helped me start thinking about who are the kinds of people that I want in my life. And they said relationships, and this can be romantic or otherwise. Um, off, uh, m many people see relationships as A to B. I'm me, you are you, and this is how we interact and how our needs and stuff, uh, you know, are totally independent within, within one another. But this concept actually mentions that there's actually a part C and that C is the, is the actual relationship itself. It's, um, it's defining this context as either growth oriented, happiness oriented or stability oriented and thinking, are we, uh, are your relation like which one of, of these is your relationships predicated on? And I know, for instance, the relationships that I find value in and that um, I know I believe are authentic are the ones that are growth oriented because that's someone who's willing to challenge me and see, you know, Randy Pausch talks about this in his TED talk uh, where he says like the people that love you the most are the ones that rag on you and harp on you because they believe that you have the potential to be better and they're willing to take the time to see you go through that. So I look for growth oriented relationships, but other people don't get recharged by that or they yeah. find that more frustrating and they need someone to provide stability and security and support their their problems with money or you know emotional support, you know, hey, you're doing a good job or cool like here's the tools to which to to do this. Um but but yeah, I, I would say those those keeping that in mind, it's been a very good guide for how I create the relationships and maybe have a little bit more of a of a grounding um, in terms of where the work stops and where the life begins. <laughs> you know, you know, the best the best and the you know, the, the most wonderful saying is, you know, if if you love what you do, then you never work a day in your life. 
you know, there's absolute truth to that. You know, you just have to figure out, it takes time to figure that, that balance out, but I wouldn't stray away from doing what you love, uh, for, from what you love. I would just, uh, you know, for fear of losing that passion, I would just lean on the people around you to give you clues as to when maybe you've crossed that threshold to doing too much or at an unhealthy level or not doing it right. And I'm, you know, I even try to, I did this kind of experiment in the last year or two where I'm just reaching out to close friends and saying, Hey, what's something that you know about me that I can change? Is it like, you know me well, what kind of feedback, just give me some critical guidance and mm -hmm. feedback. And I got some great stuff and it's because I really trust those people and I'm willing to be vulnerable with them. So, and, and, and going back to something that you said earlier, knowing that your goals might change or your, or, or your definition of success might change or, or what it is that you're wanting to focus on might change. And sometimes we, we consider ourselves hypocrites when we're actually just human and we're just moving, <laughs> you know, we're, we're always moving. Um, <clears throat> this has been amazing before, before we, we finish off, I think I'd, I'd love to hear just what are you most excited about in the next little while in terms of projects that you're working on? Um, sure. uh, like yeah, w w what are the things that, that, um, I mean, we, we've talked around this idea of like artist, plus um, entrepreneurship. But yeah, what are the things happening that you're particularly psyched about? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned at one, at one point Snarky Elephant. Snarky Elephant's a, yeah. um, uh, a new production company that uh, I'm working with uh, three other uh, co-founders that, you know, in the same, it's actually kind of like the film and TV version of Harlem Arts Festival, where we're really interested in supporting and championing emerging creators that, um, that are underrepresented in media, that they are telling their stories, you know, at their writing and performing or directing, but they are the, the biggest advocates for their work. And myself included, I'm, I'm one of those creators, uh, which is a little bit how I, I was like, wow, this is something that I would like, and here's an opportunity to create it and both funnel my own work here and, and um, support other people. So, you know, we... And that manifested from starting, we, we produced a mini series called Insomnia, uh, which think high maintenance and flea bag in Atlanta with a splash of insecure. But that did really, you know, we put our heads together and uh, Vishal Reddy, who's a super genius, um, incredible creative, he put that project together. It's about a bisexual South Asian writer that lives in New York City and supports uh, his uh, sick and by moonlighting as an escort, and he also has insomnia. Uh, so it's it's it really kind of packages what we talk about race and sexuality and identity. So we're working on a whole bunch of new projects. Uh, we've got about twenty in development, and uh, we're we've just uh, started creating this creator advisory board that's going to be in in the same way, making sure that we're staying authentic to uh, to our mission and that people coming from underrepresented backgrounds are actually the people choosing our next pool of creators. And they're the ones that can talk about their experience and relate it and hopefully act as mentors. And uh, we've got some incredible folks aligned to that. Uh, we're working on um, uh, uh, one of the projects, Rangoli is an incredible feature project that is talking about the drag experience, especially with South Asian, uh, you know, South Asian family dynamics. And so it, it's talking a lot, a lot there, but, yeah, so Snarky Elephant, I think just, you know, I enjoy building things. So mm -hmm. kind of, you know, building the community and seeing and getting a bunch of people together so we can start, uh, start, um, you know, brainstorming and thinking what are the things we want and how can we set an example? I think, you know, especially for Hollywood where you look at the diversity statistics, not just on stage, but, you know, and on screen, but off screen, right? It's above the line and below the line. That's where we're trying to really set an example of that. You know, our production, 75%, we've already done statistics and measurements that 75% of the people that are off camera are a person of color, a woman, or someone that identifies as LGBTQ+. I mean, that's really important, especially when we're making content about all of those mm -hmm. communities. And we want to make sure that every production continues to embody that. Um, so... I'm really excited about Snarky Elephant, uh, just, just in terms of what we have. We actually just got um, a Sundance um, honor. We got to the finals for a big Sundance uh, grant, um, and we're actually in the finals for another grant, and we've got some great uh, funding opportunities coming our way and uh, humoring some investors. And uh, on that side, um, I think you mentioned the Revive Big Band. That's a really exciting project as well. 
Igmar is a genius and that is going to redefine what the big band sounds like. I'm a saxophone player and a product of loving the big band. So seeing what he's done to kind of change that narrative or change that genre um, is a pretty big deal. And, and he, I think just that music, he's really reclaiming a black musical narrative, which has often been reappropriated. So they've got, you know, you can see already some announcements and we did a Kickstarter earlier this year, Talib Kweli and Terrace Martin and Corey Henry and Dr. Lonnie Smith. I mean, the lineup is Gene Baylor, Radar Ellis, like the lineup is insane. Uh, so that's going to be really amazing when it comes out. And yeah, I would say like those are the, the biggest two. Moon 31 is sort of working hand in hand with Snarky Elephant to, to make sure some of these product projects come to fruition. Um, I mentioned that um, I'm doing a film in in um, August, uh, which is super exciting. It's already gotten some press before it's even done, uh, before it's even been filmed. It's it's called um, Home Free, and it's it's actually about two two guys that uh, it's a true story that they were in college and they befriended a local homeless person. And if you kind of you've seen Hey Arnold, you know like the local legends, like Stoop Kid and Monkey Man. Like that was this guy, this guy mm -hmm. called the Professor that everyone was thought he was this tenured professor that gave it all up and uh, you know sold off all his material possessions to do this. But in reality, uh, there's more, always more to the story in the process of inviting this guy to their porch to avoid the rain. They befriend him, meet some of his other homeless friends of an unhoused um, in Austin. And um, you know it becomes this awesome, cool, amazing, special thing until it's not, until it's like, how do we, I don't deal with the fact that we did yeah. not we did not intend to have a bunch of homeless people living on our porch. We're a bunch of college kids. So you can see there's tension, there's comedy, and there's um, you know, it's an opportunity to talk about a serious issue which exists in Austin um, and in a lot of major other cities, especially now. And the soundtrack is actually being produced by Adrian for the Bad Pumas. They just won the and there's all original artists right now that it's a it's a soundtrack that, you know, from artists that were around in that time, which that's super cool. I'm not even at liberty to say who's involved, but you know, that's, they're taking some investment and you know, they're doing some more stuff too, but yeah, I'm excited about all this stuff. Awesome. I mean, that's, that's kind of, uh, that, that gives you a little bit of a taste though. I, and, and, and I think anybody listening or anybody watching can also see that like, you know, there's the, sometimes we, we have, we have to rattle off the things that we're, we're doing, but there's just such energy in terms of what uh, you know what it is that you're saying, and all of those things look incredibly interesting. And I'd like to <laughs> like, uh, follow follow along for quite a few of them. But I I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I wanted to thank you, thank you so much, Neil, uh, for taking some time to to uh, chat today. I thought it was great. Um, if anybody out there would like to learn a little bit more about um, Moon Thirty One uh, and connect with Neil, you can find him on Twitter and on Instagram at Mr. Neilio, M-I-S-T-E-R-N-E-A-L-I-O, or you can visit and sign up to his newsletter at www.neal-l-u-d-e-v-i-g.com or www.moon31.com. Uh, uh, thanks again, Neil, for, for taking the time. Thanks so much. Utter pleasure.